today's session will be starting so hello and good evening to all of you hope i'm clearly audible and visible to you guys uh, and folks so today's uh, in today's class we'll be discussing about week 2's content and uh, some question and answers which were given uh, in the assignments and uh, hi i'm ananya chatterji i'm a phd student uh, in molecular biophysics unit and in in iisc bangalore so i am a ta i am one of three ta's of the course introduction to cell biology cell components organization and processes so this course duration is january to march to 2023 and the course instructor is professor Shikha Laruria of uh, IISC Bangalore. So today I will be starting discussing few questions from assignment one, week one of this year. So the first question was Sorry. So the first question was, gram-positive bacteria are stained purple with crystal violet because. So the question was why gram-positive bacteria get stained purple when we do crystal violet staining. So options were they have thick peptidoglycan layer and no outer membrane. Second option, they have a thin peptidoglycan layer and no outer membrane. Third, they have a thick peptidoglycan layer and a thin outer membrane. The fourth option was, they completely lack the peptidoglycan layer but have an outer membrane. So, I would like to discuss what is crystal violet staining at first. So, the staining is also called gram staining. So, what happens? If we compare gram-positive bacteria and gram-negative bacteria cell wall, we can see, what we can see is that this is the cell wall of gram-positive bacteria and this is the cell wall of gram-negative bacteria. So, in this case, they have very thick mesh-like cell wall. You can see this blue color or the, the purple colored uh, thing is the cell wall of gram-positive bacteria. So, this cell wall, you, we all know that cell wall is made up of peptidoglycan. So, so in this case, the 50 to 90 percent of cell envelope is made up, made up of uh, peptidoglycan and what happens in the case of gram-negative bacteria, the amount of peptidoglycan is less. So they have a thinner wall, you can see 10 percent of cell envelope. So when we stain with crystal violet, maximum amount of stain gets So, in the case of gram-positive bacteria, it's stained well, it's stained purple by crystal violet, whereas gram-negative bacteria have a thinner layer of peptidoglycan, do not retain the purple stain. And uh, when in the process of uh, crystal violet staining or gram staining, so here, there, there is a uh, at the end, at the end step, we do counter stain with safranine. So, in the case of in the case of gram negative bacteria, they uh, got stained pink by the um, presence of safranine. So, what are the steps of gram stain? Uh, at first, we apply a primary stain or crystal violet to a heat fixed smear of bacterial culture. So why the uh, bacterial culture is heat fixed because uh, so that the bacteria cannot move and we can stain and we can wash uh, likewise okay. So uh, you can see that heat fixation kills some bacteria but it is mostly used to fix the bacteria to the slide so that they don't rinse out during the staining procedure. Now the next step is uh, the addition of iodine which uh, what happens now it can trap crystal valid and traps in the cell 
okay and in, it binds with crystal violet then we do wash so rapid decolorization decolor with ethanol or acetone uh, then we counter stain with saffronin okay and another uh, kind of uh, counter stain we can use that is carbol fusion so it can be also substituted uh, in the in the place of saffronin so this is a process of counter uh, gram staining so we we now know that the reason is that they have a thick peptidoglycan which can retain the crystal violet stain properly now coming to, to the next question which of the following statement does not hold true for the nucleolus so before going to the question we want to know what is nucleolus so the nucleolus is a spherical structure it can be found in the cell's nucleus and whose primary function is to produce and assembles the cell's ribo ri ribosomes so here you can see this is a cell and inside the cell there is a nucleus and inside nucleus there is a place where uh, which place is the actually the place for ribosome, ribosomal RNA gene synthesis and the uh, and and eventually gets transcribed. So that place is called rib uh, nucleolus. So uh, once assembled, the ribosomes are transported to the cell cytoplasm where they serve as the sites for protein synthesis or translation. So within a cell's nucleus is a special structure called nucleolus that houses the ribosomal machinery. It is separate from the rest of the nucleus because of the specialized function. So it is separated from the nucleus not, not because of it is membrane bounded but because it has a specialized fu function. Okay, so it does not contain any chromosomes and is able to shuttle ribosomes and ribosomal RNA out of the nucleus and into the cytoplasm. Okay, so uh, then we will come back to the question. So it stated that which of the following does not hold true. So it is a dense body present in the nucleus. This is correct. It is a site of rRNA synthesis. This is also correct. It is bound by a thin membrane. No. We don't have any evidence of membrane which is uh, which makes nucleolus separated from the nucleus not like that it is a site of ribosome assembly this is also true so what is uh, incorrect it is bound by a thin membrane this this statement is wrong now coming to the next question the cell membrane is termed as selectively permeable because so we have uh, discussed about the mem cell membrane and its permeability so we have discussed the cell membrane is made up of lipid and protein so maximum lipid so lipid we know that hydrophobic so permeable par permeability we can get get that whatever uh, substance are hydrophobic that will be easily permeable so we will discuss about that so if you consider this is a synthetic lipid bilayer okay uh, like our membrane only cell membrane only so in this case what happened whatever is the hydrophobic molecules like any gaseous oxygen carbon dioxide nitrogen any hormones steroid hormones which is hydrophobic or uh, uh, which can be passed through the uh, lipid molecules okay that's that those can be easily passed and small unchurched polar molecules like uh, water, urea, glycerol, ammonia, those can pulse but at smaller amount. But larger unchurched polar molecule, but those are large, that is glucose, sucrose, that can pulse very less amount and very slow. But ions which are polar, like H plus, Na plus, which are ions, so they can they cannot pass through the synthetic lipid bilayer easily and by diffusion okay so the relative permeability of a synthetic bilayer to a different class of molecules you can see the smaller the molecule and more importantly the less strongly it associates with water the more rapidly the molecule diffuses across the bilayer so the the cell membrane is termed as selectively permeable because it allows the free diffusion of gases hydrophobic and small answers to polar molecules such as water and also contains transporters to selectively transport large polar answers molecule molecules such as glucose
Now the next question is pick the correct statement. So guanine is a purine base, thymine is a purine base, cytosine is a purine base and adenine is a pyrimidine base. So we know that DNA, uh, the best, the best pairs which formed in the DNA are adenine, thymine, guanine and cytosine. So adenine and thymine they form double hydrogen bonds in between them and in the case of G, uh, A to G. A to T and G to C okay so we know that there are two kind of kinds of base purine base and pyrimidine base so in purine what comes adenine and guanine are purine and cytosines are uh, and thymine are pyrimidine so in this case what is right or the correct statement is guanine is a purine base now coming to the Chardas rule which we discussed in uh, previous class also So Chargaff's rule states that, so as we know that A makes bond with T, so the amount of A should be equal to the amount of T and the amount of G should be equal to amount of T. So the A by T should be, should equals to 1, okay. So what should be the right answer? The ratio of amounts of A to T and G to C are close to unity in DNA. Which of the following organisms belong to prokaryote? Yeast, animal cells, archaea and proteases. This is very easy. Archaea. Okay. And in this case, what was the answer? The ratio of amounts of A to C, A to T and G to C are close to unity. Now coming to the base of DNA so this is a uh, pyrimidine base so you can see that uh, we can uh, so it consists of two nitrogen in this uh, hexagonal so we can uh, uh, name 1 2 3 4 5 6 anti-clockwise and this is purine this is two cyclic rings uh, in in purine so adenine and guanine uh, comes under purine and G guanine cytosine and uracil comes under pyrimidine so you should uh, note down the structure of adenine guanine cytosine uracil and thymine this is very important to uh, understand and uh, too important to memorize uh, what is the structure uh, okay so now coming to the uh, bacteria archaea and eukaryotic phylogenetic tree so here we can see that uh, under bacteria these are the uh, these are the um, organism comes like uh, examples e coli bacillus cyanobacteria and th this is the fa archaea family and this is eukaryote so you can see that yeast uh, then giardia trypanosoma comes under uh, eukaryotes this is archaea and this is bacteria okay now coming to the next slide next question is that which of the following is true regarding carbon atom Carbon forms unstable carbon-carbon bond. Carbon can form four covalent bonds. There is an obvious upper limit to the size of rings and chains formed by uh, carbon atoms. So no, the carbon doesn't form unstable carbon-carbon bonds. But this is the true that carbon can form four co covalent bond. Okay. Now coming to the next question. Which of the following allows the ions to diffuse down the concentration gradient? So what is concentration gradient that if this is a lipid bilayer or something and you have large amount of Na plus over here okay and you have very small amount of nothing or no Na plus here. So if Na plus ion comes from there to there so this is across the gradient or diffuse down the concentration gradient. So in this case who uh, takes care of this ion channels now we have to understand the what what is the difference of ion channels or ion trans transporters so ion channels are for form forming membrane proteins that allow the movement of ions through the cell membrane transporters what is transporters not transporters are transfer membrane proteins that transport the ions across the cell membrane but it's most important that it is against the concentration gradient now ion channels transport ions through the concentration or electrochemical gradient
ओके आयन चैनल्स दिस आर द पैसिव ट्रांसपोर्ट मेकेजम सिंस सेल्युलर एनर्जी इज नॉट यूज फॉर द ट्रांसपोर्टेशन ऑफ आयन्स What is transporter? A transport transporter is an active transport mechanism since ATP is used in the form of cellular energy. So when uh, some substances or ions or anything is present lesser quantity at uh, some space or some area uh, or the some site um, uh, of the lipid bilayer. So if it comes from the lower concentration to higher concentration, we know that we need to apply some energy. or need to apply uh, need to uh, like uh, invest some energy so that kind of transporter is active transporter because in this case atp or the source of energy is used now ion channel if we give some um, uh, examples voltage gated ion channels ligand gated ion channels and uh, acoporins are the are three types and transporters primary transporters symporters and antiporters are three types now the next question is that the bond between the nitrogen base and the sugar group in nucleotide is termed as we know in glycosidic bond uh, sorry this one so why it is in glycosidic bond because this is the sugar okay and this is the base so in from the base the nitrogen is forming bond with the um, uh, carbon of the sugar so here one which was there and one uh, here one each was there so it forms a h2 and it uh, um, exits so what happens the form a bond between this uh, base to sugar and it forms a n glycosidic bond uh, now the next question is that in an rna molecule uracil replaces which of the following base found in dna so we know that cytosine uh, sorry uh, we know that thymine uracil replaces thymine uh, in the case of dna okay in the case of rna we know that uracil is there but in the case of dna thymine or t is there now coming to the next question uh, okay so this was a week one assignment uh, one question and answer discussion now we will i will discuss week two assignment two so any doubt uh, anyone or uh, we will go ahead with the next set of questions and answers so the first question was pick the correct statement about npf so what is npf MP, mpf if mito mpf is mitogen promoting factor okay so the options are mpf activity is transient mpf consists two of two subunits mpf induces an immature oocyte to become an egg so the answer is all of the above because it is true that mpf activity is transient it promotes the uh, mitosis so as it is mitosis uh, promoting factor so it also consists of two subunits this is also true and uh, some experiments which 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 is also discussed in class is that uh, some experiment has proved that it can induce an immature oocyte to become an egg if you inject or micro injection uh, inject uh, mpf factors into an immature oocyte it will divide okay so to this to elaborate it more so mpf is a maturation promoting factor or uh, it is abbreviated as mpf also mitosis promoting factor or inflase promoting factor is a cycling cdk complex that was discovered first in frog eggs it stimulates the mitotic and meiotic phases of the cell cycle mpf promotes the entrance into mitosis from the g2 phase by phosphorylating multiple proteins needed during mitosis okay so this is activated at the end of g2 by a phosphatase which removes an inhibitory phosphate group added earlier so mpf is also called the mfis kinase because of its ability to phosphorylate target proteins at a specific point in the cell cycle and thus control their ability to function so as we as we were discussing that mpf is composed of two subunits one is cyclin dependent kinase 1 the cyclin dependent kinase subunit so 
uh, or it is also called CD case cyclin dependent kinase okay so kinase means it has a role in phosphorylate um, some target proteins okay so it uses ATP to phosphorylate specific serine or threonine residues of target proteins and another subunit is cyclin a regulatory subunit the cyclines are necessary for the kinase subunit to function with the appropriate substance so the mitotic cyclines can be grouped as cyclines a and b the cyclines have a nine residue sequence in the n terminal region called as destruction box which can be recognized by the ubiquitin ligase enzyme which destroys the cyclines when appropriate so in in a cell the amount of cyclin is not constant okay cyclin will get uh, like uh, proteolytically cleaved and uh, it gets destructed but the amount of cdk is constant so during G1 and S phase, the CDK1 subunit of MPF is inactive due to an inhibitory enzyme called V1. So V1 phosphorylates the tyrosine 15 residue in yeast and tyrosine 15 residue is humans of CDK1, rendering MPF inactive. So during the transition of G2 to M phase, CDK1 is dephosphorylated by CDC25. Uh, so what happens V1 basically phosphorylate um, to make it inactive at tyrosine 15 residue but when CDK1 should be activated uh, CDC25 uh, dephosphorylates CDK1 and then it becomes active. So then that becomes free and it can bind with cyclin B. Uh, eventually activate maturation promoting factor and make the, make the cell to enter my mitosis so the answer is that uh, mpf activity is transient mpf co consists of two subunits mpf induces an immature site to become an egg so all of the above is the correct answer <coughs> Now the next question is that in a CDC25 mutant, CDC2 will. So in a CDC25 mutant, what will happen to CDC2? So if we see this diagram, we can see that. So you have to understand this chart, okay? So this is basically like cyclines and CDKs act activities in the uh, phase of uh, during interphase mitosis and uh, so intermelic G1, G2S and mitosis phase. So what happens? We are concerned uh, in the question we are concerned about uh, CDC25 mutant what happened to CDC2. So we will eventually see that when CDC25 will uh, remains mutated the CDC will uh, remain inactivated but how uh, it will happen sorry how it will happen let me erase the we will discuss so if you see the diagram so cd what is cdc2 cdc2 is a cyclin dependent kinase so it is also known as cdc28 in the case of uh, saccharomyces cerevisiae CDC13 it is a cyclin so we know that uh, there is a two component okay CD, uh, cyclin dependent kinase or CDK and cyclin which binds with CDK so in the case in this case CDC13 is a cyclin and CDC2 is a CDK or cyclin dependent kinase and we know there is also uh, two protein protein plays uh, important role those are V1 which is inhibitory kinase and CDC25 which is a phosphatase okay so what is happening here this is CDC2 it has so these are some residues of this protein tyrosine 160 uh, like threonine 161 tyrosine 15 tyrosine 14 so what happens when uh, cycling activating kinase uh, and V1 acts upon this so what happens uh, uh, cycling also comes and binds with CDC2 but uh, what uh, V1 does 
V1 phosphorylate Y15, okay, and it eventually inactivates this complex, so it becomes inactivated. But then CDC25 comes and uh, dephosphorylate Y15, so then it again becomes activated. Uh, so so the question was that when there there will be no cdc25 what will happen to cdc2 cdc2 is this so um, if you don't have cdc25 then no protein won't be able to like the proteins any protein won't be able to dephosphorylate this y15 residue so the cdc2 will become uh, will remain inactivated okay i think it's clear so now coming to the next question pick the correct statement about cell cycle checkpoint pathways number one they slow down or arrest cell cycle progression to allow cells to recover from any damage this is true they ensure the fidelity of ongoing cell division this is also true they involve an effective protein that inhibits cell cycle progression obviously this is true so cell cycle checkpoint well, basically what is what it does it ensures that everything is going well everything is going fine cell uh, dna is uh, replicating properly there is no dna damage uh, then every 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 other factors which will eventually need for cell division is perfect so that's how the cell cycle checkpoint pathways work so in this case all the uh, above statements are correct so this is also a small diagram of regulation of CDK and cycline. You can see that this is a cycline dependent kinase and then cycline will bind with cycline dependent kinase. So there will be activating phosphate here that makes the whole complex active. But V1 kinase will uh, phosphorylate uh, another uh, tyrosine which eventually will lead to uh, make this complex inactive okay and cdc2 cdc25 is a phosphatase which will eventually uh, remove for uh, this uh, for phosphate so uh, like acts as a phosphatase and uh, it become the complex will become active again so uh, what is written here you can see this active cycling cdk complex is turned off when the kinase v1 phosphorylase two uh, closely spaced sites of active site and removal of this phosphates uh, not this phosphate this phosphate by the phosphatase cdc25 uh, activates the cycling cdk complex again uh, sorry to disturb um are you presenting something ma'am because uh, uh, there is nothing shared on the screen oh, oh, oh. oh sorry so till till now you have not seen it, anything uh, yes ma'am actually we are uh, not able to uh, see anything okay. uh, we just remember the question so we can get what you are disc describing sorry, sorry, sorry. but uh, nothing is said Sorry, sorry, I'm so sorry. I didn't, I didn't notice only that I have not shared anything. Okay, sorry for the trouble. Okay, yes, I'm sharing things. Um, sorry for the disturbance, guys. I hope now my screen is visible. So. Uh, yes, yes, now the screen is visible. Okay, so if you have any doubt uh, regarding whatever I discussed, I can just quickly uh, go through. So, yeah. Yeah, so I was discussing um, the question answers from the assignment I discussed. So, I think uh, you if you have any questions whatever i uh, discussed you can let me know i will just quickly uh, go through okay so this is the things i have discussed till now so let's 
just to make you understand i will just quickly go through this the, these are the questions so i will go through where uh, i have put down some notes so this is gram positive bacteria and this is gram negative bacteria this is peptidoglycan layer of gram positive bacteria this is the thin layer of peptidoglycan of gram negative bacteria so it gets uh, stained uh, like it can retain crystal violet uh, properly because the amount of peptide glycan is much more in the case of uh, gram positive bacteria but in the case of gram negative bacteria we know that it has very uh, thinner layer <coughs> it has very thinner layer uh, so do not retain the purple stain and the counter stain uh, pink uh, when whenever we counter stain by saffronine it uh, counter stained as pink okay so th there are two steps uh, i told that crystal violet to uh, we apply crystal violet then we what you do we apply iodine we apply iodine uh, then what we do now we will uh, dim we will apply alcohol to deco decolorized and uh, then again we will counter stain with saffronine so when counter stain with saffronine so now the second i uh, described our nucleus i will not go in details but i will just uh, emphasize on the uh, whatever i have written and whatever uh, there is in diagram that nucleus is not uh, membrane bound and membrane uh, is not separated by a membrane from the nucleus rather it is a site where uh, it produces and assembles cells ribosome and uh, nucleus is also where ribosomal rna genes are transcribed so then once assembled ribosomes are transported to the cell cytoplasm where they serve as a sites for protein synthesis now we'll just quickly go through uh, about the permeability of lipid bilayer we know that hydrophobic small hydrophobic molecules uh, and all hydrophobic molecules like gases steroid hormones which are uh, hydrophobic and uh, can easily pass through lipid bilayer and small unchurched uh, polar molecules that is water urea glycerol ammonia that can also pass but the amount is less and it is time taking and very large unchurched polar molecules like glucose sucrose that those can also pass through the membrane but the amount is very low but all the ions which are um, not hydrophobic and so they cannot pass uh, through the lipid membrane at all now we discussed about these questions and hope these are clear for for all of you so these are the base you have to remember these structures as i told before the purine base and pyrimidine base you have to memorize atgc and u structure this is essential uh, to understand what kind of reactions is happening and all so this is a adenine and this is guanine so these are of purine bases and uh, this is cytosine uracil and thymine so these are of uh, pyrimidine so this is a uh, diagram where uh, you can see the uh, phylogenetic tree you can see that uh, where you can see bacteria archaea and eukaryotes so there is human maize and tri trichomon trichomonas all are eukaryotes and uh, these are archaea and this is bacteria so uh, then we discussed ion channels and transporter okay so these questions we had discussed hope you don't have any uh, query or if you have query please uh, let me know so for the regarding ion channels and transporter the main thing is that it is a passive transporter so these are basically the pore forming membrane protein that allow the movement of ions through the cell membrane uh, and transporters are the transmembrane proteins that transport ions across the cell membrane against the concentration gradient transport ions uh, through the concentration or electrochemical gradient and transporter ions uh, move across the cell membrane against the gradient and in the case of uh, ion channels a passive transport mechanism since cellular energy is not used for the transportation of ions but in the case of transporter as i was discussing that whenever you are uh, trying to pass some molecules uh, through it against its concentration gradient you should apply you should give some energy which will uh, transport those ions okay so this is active transport mechanism since atp is used in the form of cellular energy so some examples of uh, ion channels 
are voltage gated ion channels, ligand, ligand gated ion channels and aquaporins are the three types and uh, for the transporter, primary transporters, importers, antiporters are the three types. So then we discussed about in glycosidic bond which uh, forms the bond between uh, bases, urine or pyrimidine bases and uh, sugar group in nucleotide. Now we started uh, discussing about week 2 assignment 2. So the first question was what is NPF? So to discuss about NPF, NPF is a maturation promoting factor. Uh, also uh, it, it is called mitosis promoting factor. So what it promotes, NPF's uh, promoting factor also it is called. So what it promotes is that there is a cyclin CDK complex. Okay, the, and that was first discovered in frog eggs. So what it stimulates, it stimulates the mitotic and meiotic phases of the cell cycle. So, uh, so it promotes the entrance into mitosis from the G2 phase or from the interphase um, by phosphorylating multiple proteins needed during mitosis. So mitosis promoting factor is activated at the end of G2 by a phosphatase which removes an inhibitory phosphate group added earlier. So this NPF is also called NPF kinase because of its ability to phosphorylate target proteins as a specific point in the cell cycle and thus control their ability to function. So it's called kinase because it can phosphorylate some other target protein. Okay. Now uh, what is NPF and how it is composed of? So NPF is con composed of two subunits. So one is cyclin dependent kinase 1, CDK1. So uh, it uses ATP to phosphorylate specific serine or thre th thiotrionine residues of target proteins and cyclins, this is a regulatory subunit. The cyclins are necessary for the kinase subunit to function with the appropriate substrate. The mitotic cyclins can be grouped as cyclins A and B. These cyclins have a nine residue sequence in the N-terminal region called the destruction box. Okay which can, can be recognized by the ubiquitin ligase enzyme which destroyed the cyclins when appropriate. During G1 and S phase, the CDK1 subunit of NPF is inactive due to an inhibitory enzyme V1. So V1, what is v, V1? This is a very important enzyme. So it is an inhibitory enzyme. What it does? It inactivates the CDK1 phosphate, uh, sub, uh, CDK1 subunit by phosphorylating one tyrosine residue. Okay, so it uh, phosphorylates tyrosine 15 residues in yeast and also tyrosine 15 residue in humans of CDK1 and it makes mitotin um, or mitosis promoting factor inactive. So during the transition of G2 to N phase, CDK1 is dephosphorylated by CDC25. The CDK1 subunit is now free. Now comes there is, there is a role of CDC25 which uh, phosphor and dephosphorylates one tyrosine 15 residue and the MPF becomes active again. Now we discussed about the regulation of uh, um, MPF or CDK cycling complex. So the as we were discussing the diagrammatic representation. So this is CDK and this is cycling. So there is a phospho phosphate. Uh, uh, there is a amino acid which can be phosphorylated and if it gets phosphorylated it makes the complex active okay but uh, v1 what it does it's a kinase so it is a uh, another is a another kinase which will eventually uh, just a second So another kinase which will eventually phosphor phosphorylate one tyrosine residue uh, so it will uh, make the complex inactive but uh, CDC25 it's a phosphatase what it does it in dephosphorylate the inhibitory phosphate and makes the complex again active Now in the case of Saccharomyces pombe we can see CDC2, CDC2 is also called as cyclin dependent kinase okay and this is called CDC28 in the case of Saccharomyces cerevisiae. The same name, uh, the same protein just named differently. CDC13, 
CTC-13 is uh, also called cyclin V1. It is an inhibitory kinase. It phosphorylates tyrosine 15 of CTC-2. Then uh, CTC-25, it is a phosphatase. Mm, uh, it uh, removes the phosphate of uh, tyrosine 15 of CTC-2 and activates CTC-2 and cyclin-13. Uh, CDC2 and CDC13 or cyclene complex. So this uh, you have to this chart or this um, like uh, we were discussing you have to understand is that this is CDC2 or cyclene dependent kinase. Okay, this is also called cyclene dependent kinase CDK. So it has it, it, it is a protein so it some amino acids can get phosphorylated or dephosphorylated so in the case of cdc2 or cyclin dependent kinase this threonine 161 tyrosine 15 and tyrosine 14 can get phosphorylated so when uh, cyclin also comes and uh, gets attached so cak means cyclin activating kinase so and v1 is a is a inhibitory kinase so it phosphorylate tyrosine 15 and makes the complex inactive but when uh, cdc25 dephosphorylated this tyrosines it again becomes active and then um, the complex becomes active so now we will uh, go to the cell cycle checkpoints so you know this is a mitosis uh, or the cell division uh, mitotic cell division so here we will be discussing the cell cycle checkpoint so uh, a cell cycle control system triggers the essential process of the cell cycle so what are the essential process of the cell cycle DNA replication mitosis and cytokinesis and the control system is represented here as a central arm or the controller that rotates clockwise so this is a control system so it rotates clockwise and uh, is represented here central arm and the controller so the controller basically some proteins which uh, determines that whether everything is going correctly or not so should i uh, the dna has become like there is a damage in dna during uh, replication or during uh, you know, like the division so we we cannot proceed through so we have to stop at that at that stage so there is some checkpoints so uh, what happens when it reaches specific transition on the outer wall so uh, information about the completion of cell cycle events as well as the signals of the event from the environment can cause the control system to arrest the cycle at those transitions so in this transition what happens uh, when uh, cell like goes from g2 phase to m phase so we want to ensure that is all dna are replicated or not is the environmental favorable to go for cell division so then g2 to m transition happens and the cell enters into mitosis in the in the during the m phase what happens this is a question these are the question that are all the chromosomes attached to spindle we know the cell division process that cell to divide the cells, the cytoplasm, the chromosomes need to attach to the spindle. So, and microtubules. So then only the uh, then the chromosome can gets uh, separated and then goes to two different poles. And then then only the side, then only the cell division will be appropriate. So then it's uh, is there, there is a question that are all chromosomes attached to the spindle? If it's correct and if the answer is yes, then metaphase to anaphase trans transition happens. Then it triggers anaphase and proceeds to cytokinesis. Now there is another checkpoint between G1 and S. So in this in this uh, duration, there is a question that the if the environment is favorable or not, all the uh, enzymes and the proteins required for cell division requ like required for cell division required for uh, dna replications are there or not so this is the this is these are some checkpoints so we already started discussing week 2 assignment 2 now the some other questions the non cycling cells stay in which state G1 phase, uh, G0 phase, G2 or M phase or S phase. 
so we know that the cells which are not dividing uh, that can stay at g0 phase so what is g0 phase so the g0 phase describes the cellular state okay and the cellular state outside of the replicating cell cycle classically cells were thought to enter g0 primarily due to environmental factors like nutrient deprivation that limited the resource necessary for proliferation thus it was thought of as resting phase or g0 phase so g0 is now known to take different forms and occur for multiple reasons for example most adult neuronal cells among the most metabolically active cells in the body are fully differentiated and reside uh, in a terminal g0 phase neurons reside in this state not because of sto stochastic or limited nutrition supply but as a part of developmental program so the three g0 states exist and can be categorized as either reversible reversible means the cell is at quiescent step it can also revert back to cell cycle or irreversible that irreversible means cells have become senescent or these are differentiated like neurons that will not that that will never go back to the cell cycle or g or the s phase again okay so each of these three states can be entered from the g1 phase before the cell commences to the next round of cell cycle quiescence refers to the reversible g0 states where subpopulations of cells reside in a quiescent state before entering the cell cycle after activation in response to extrinsic signals quiescent cells are often identified by low rna content lack of cell proliferation markers increased level retention indicating of low cell turnover senescence is a distinct from quiescence because senescence is an irreversible state that cells enter in response to dna damage or degradation that would make a cell's progeny non viable so in this case you can see the cell cycle uh, here i will start from g1 okay so in in the case of g1 cell is growing but then the it has an opportunity to go to resting phase or g0 phase that will the, in that case cell will leave the cell cycle but also it can go through the s phase where the daughter cell will divide into another cells so in the case of s phase uh, we can see this is uh, the, the the very end of uh, cell cycle you can see telophase of cytokinesis where a cell will divide properly uh, like the two daughter cells and then um, cytokinesis will happen but if we see if we see that uh, from g1 what happens now it can also go to uh, s phase if it's not going to g0 stage so in g a s phase what happens cell will duplicate its dna then in the case of g2 what happens the cell will grow some more and it will uh, it will assembles all the required items which will be uh, required uh, in the case of uh, mitosis and then cell will go to mitosis so mitosis there is some steps prophase prophase prometaphase metaphase anaphase and then telophase that we were discussing at the end of the cell cycle telophase and cytokinesis happens and then then it forms two daughter cells now our next question was so the answer is the non cycling cells will stay in g0 phase now the next question is treatment with hydroxyurea delays the cells in which state so what the, what do hydroxyurea do so hydroxyurea reduces intracellular deoxy nucleotide triphosphate or dntp pools and acts as an s phase specific agent with inhibition of dna synthesis and eventual cellular cytotoxicity so hydroxyurea is used to treat cancer of the white blood cells called chronic myeloid leukemia it may also 
be given together with radiation treatment for head and neck cancer. So it interferes with the growth of cancer cells. It interferes with the DNA replication. So that in a cell, if DNA replication doesn't uh, happen properly, the cell will not be able to divide. So it will hamper the division rate of cancer cells. So that's how it acts. Okay, and which are eventually destroyed. Thus, those cells were eventually destroyed in the body. So, the answer is uh, treatment with hydroxyurea delays the cell in space because the division of the like the replication of the DNA occurs in space. Now we have to know the structure as I told, uh, structure of this purine and pyrimidine base. So here the question is urine uracil is similar to thymine, except. What is the exception between uracil and thymine structure? Okay, so if we see the thymine structure 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, so you can see that there is a keto group at 2 and 4 carbon and there is a methyl group at 5 carbon. But if you see the structure of uh, uracil, which is present in RNA, you can see there is keto group in at 2 and 4 carbon, but there is no methyl group at five uh, carbon positions okay so this will be the answer that uracil is a uracil lacks methyl group at the fifth position the term provirus refers to options are the viral dna that is stably integrated into the host dna the viral rna that is stably integrated into the host rna the viral DNA that can replicate only in the presence of viral proteins. So the answer is provirus. We have heard the name of profulge where the genetic material of bacteriophage gets uh, inserted into the genome of uh, bacteria. So it's like that only the provirus so where the viral DNA that is stably integrated into the host DNA. <coughs> Now, you can see this is a provirus. So, this is a viral genome that is integrated into the DNA, DNA of the host cells. So, here you can see this is the HIV virus. Okay, when it infects, it will react with this receptor present on the cell membrane. So, it will interact and then will go inside the cell, and then it will release its viral RNA. So, if uh, as it has RNA, so it uh, the reverse transcription will happen, and from RNA we will get DNA. So in then DNA will replicate and form double stranded DNA and it will enter into the nucleus. And then it will enter into the nucleus and then eventually if it gets inserted in the uh, DNA or, or the genome of the host then the uh, thing will be called a provirus. Now next question is that which of the following can affect transcription what is transcription transcription is uh, I, think, I think i have got a question yes the video recording will be uploaded on youtube any question from anyone uh, so there is a um, there is a youtube channel uh, called nptl cell biology uh, to January 2023 so where I am uploading all the uh, all the weekly recording recorded videos from my side so there are also uh, two other TAs they are also uploading uh, videos of their part that will be on different channel so um, so that's it. I will eventually give you the link at the end of this meet today's meeting and I will upload today's content and every day's content in that uh, YouTube channel. Now I am coming back to the question which we are discussing that which of the following can affect transcription. So what is transcription? Transcription is that uh, where RNA is generated from DNA. Okay. So what is the following can affect? Chromosome location. Nucleosome occupancy, cis regulatory elements, and epigenetic modification. So, what should be the answer? The answer is all because 
chromosome location can obviously hamper or the affect transcription because that is where the transcription happens from DNA to RNA. Nucleosome occupancy, as we know, that um, there are several RNAs, okay, rRNA, tRNA, mRNA. So, nucleosome is the source of rRNA. So, if nucleosome occupancy, there is something that it is not able to produce proper amount of uh, or the uh, the adamant amount, like the exact amount of rRNA, so then it can also affect transcription. Cis regulatory elements, what happens now, repressors and all, if it gets bind with the uh, positions of the DNA where RNA polymerase will come and bound, then this kind of uh, regulation can impact, can give an impact on transcription. So this can all be the case of uh, affecting transcription. Now the second question is that during the elongation step of protein synthesis, the incoming charged tRNA binds to which side of the ribosome first. So so any questions anyone? So before going to the that question, we will see the diagram of uh, uh, translation, okay? Where is the schematic diagram? Where you can see that this is the initiator tRNA, which is bound to P, which is bound to P side. Is, that means that when it scans, where is the start codon? So AUG is the start, start codon, and ag against that, the anticodon in the tRNA is USC, so it will get bind to the P. Then another charged tRNA will come with next amino acid, and it will bind to A side. So in uh, yeah, this subunit of ribosome there are three sides a p and e so a is basically amino acid size p is peptidal side and e is exit side so then the next uh, trna will come along with the next amino acid then uh, it will bound with uh, with, with the antigodon it will bind with mrna then what will happen there will be the peptidal bond formation between the amino acids of uh, p sides and a side and eventually the uh, blank tRNA will go to E side and it will exit and then A the tRNA which is present in A side will go to with will go to P sides and the next uh, tRNA will come. So the answer will be the charged tRNA binds to A side first. Now the question is which is the following proteins acts as a mediator protein during DNA damage response MRC1, RAD9, RNA, RNR3 or all of the above. So we know that RAD9 is uh, essential to sense DNA damage and uh, acts as a mediated protein during uh, DNA uh, response. So RAD9 will be the answer. So here you can see that any uh, repair, any DNA uh, like DNA damage happens, so it senses it and then it transduce and amplify of the DNA damage signal happens and then eventually what it does it activate our phosphorylated RAD53. Okay so these are some transcription factors mm, uh, you know that which uh, basically alters or affects uh, transcription. So activated proteins which bind to a piece of DNA called enhancers, their binding causes the DNA to bend, bringing them near a gene promoter, even though they may be thousands of best pairs away. So this activated proteins, what happens that we know this is DNA, okay? And there is a site uh, which is called enhancer. So what happens, activated protein will uh, come and bind, bind to some part of DNA and then this what will happen when some proteins is getting bound with DNA this uh, portion may bend and bringing the gene promoter near them so so that is how it can activate uh, transcription other uh, transcription factors proteins join the activated proteins forming a protein complex which binds to the gene promoter then will come this protein complex makes it easier for RNA polymerase to attach to the promoter and start transcribing the gene. So this protein complex what happens it will uh, facilitate the binding of RNA polymerase into it and then start <coughs> transcribing.
then uh, we will go we will see that an insulator can stop the enhancer from binding to promoter if a protein called ctcf named for the sequence cccdc which occurs in all the insulators binds to it so an insulator also like there is a factor called ctcf okay it uh, it also the, so insulator can also <coughs> stop the enhance enhancers from binding to the promoter so you can see that this this comes under the uh, some modification which happens when it uh, it's not in it's not uh, helping the transcribe rather it will it it, it is uh, reacting against the transcription now some other uh, epigenetic modification can can happen like uh, methylation the addition of methyl group to the cytosine nucleotides that what happens it prevents ctcf from attaching the in, in uh, insulator so then if ctcf will not attach to insulator then it will get turned off and allowing the enhancers to bind the promoters so then the enhancer will bind to the promoter and enhance the transcription now we will discuss week 2 assignment 1 so this is from la uh, last year's uh, assignment so here you can see the first question is that choose the correct order of events of a mitotic cell cycle it's a very easy question g1 phase s phase g2 phase and m phase the protein p53 induces expression of p21 after checkpoint activation p20 and 21 is a what is p21 so p21 if you know is a cdk inhibitor inhibitory kinase okay so in this uh, schematic you can see that uh, this is a p53 uh, protein it comes and bind uh, 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 acts as a regulator of p21 gene transcription so then p21 uh, protein gets translated and then p21 will bind with a cyclin cdk complex and will eventually uh, promotes the cell cycle okay the the division so uh, the protein p53 induces p53 induces expression of p21 after checkpoint activation so so okay so when when p uh, sorry when p21 will bind to cyclin and cdk what happens the cyclin and cdk will get inactivate so this cell cycle or cell division will not be able to happen okay so this basically making the cyclin cdk complex inactive not active okay whenever we are bound with that the cyclin and cdk will not be able to free so the cell division will not occur now we'll go to next question in an experiment when cytoplasm from an m phase oocyte is micro injected into uh, in a g2 phase oocyte what will be the possible effect so we know from the experiment of npf that uh, if we micro inject uh, anything uh, any substance from m phase oocyte to g2 phase the g2 phase will also uh, driven to m phase as uh, those uh, cytoplasm contents from m phase has uh, mpf that is mitogen mitosis promoting factors so the answer will be g2 side will be driven to m phase Now the next question is that which of the following is the longest phase in the cell cycle so definitely interphase which consists of g1 s and g2 is the longest phase in the cell cycle now the question is select the incorrect statements cdc 28 mutant cells do not initiate dna synthesis cdc 28 mutant cells cannot progress beyond the start point cdc 28 encodes a cyclin dependent kinase 20 cdc 28 mutant cells can progress to s phase so the incorrect statement is definitely cdc 28 mutant can progress to s phase it cannot progress to s phase next question is that select the incorrect statement about cdc2 protein cdc2 levels do not change during mitosis cdc2 become phosphorylated on entry to stationary phase cdc2 phosphorylation correlates with high mitotic index cdc2 has kinase activity so the incorrect statement is that cdc2 
becomes phosphorylated on entry to S base. Which of the following enzymes is inhibited by hydroxyurea? So as we know that hydroxyurea uh, does not allow the cells to divide. So basically it inhibits ribonucleotide reductase, the rate limiting enzyme of DNTP synthesis. Now the, now the next question is that CDK activity is regulated by cyclin association, inhibitory phosphorylation, threonine 14 and tyrosine 15, activating phosphorylation of threonine 161. We have seen in the previous figures is that all of the above should be correct. Cyclin association, when cyclin gets bound to CDK, it activates CDK. Uh, it can be uh, phosphorylated or dephosphorylated by inhibitory protein V1 <coughs> or activating protein CDC25. Okay. So all of the above is correct. Ubiquitin is covalently conjugated to protein targets at lysine. We know that. Now the next question is that which of the following genes may complement the phenotype of Saccharomyces pompe CDC2 mutant. So we previously discussed that the CDC2 um, is equivalent to human CDK1 or cyclic independent kinase 1. Now we have discussed uh, week 1 and uh, week 2 assignments along with uh, week 2 assignments of previous year. Uh, previous day we have discussed uh, week 1 assignments of previous year. So if you have any questions you can let me know. We will, uh, we will discuss the week 3 and uh, yeah, week 3 assignments of previous year and this year next day okay next week so now i will just briefly discuss some topics of uh, vesicular transportation so uh, in this diagram <coughs> You can see that endocytic what is endocytic pathway and secretory pathway. So in a cell where we know the different cargoes gets uh, delivered through the get delivered and get transported through the cells uh, through endocytic pathways. So these compartments are topologically equivalent. Okay. So top, some topologically equivalent compartments in the secretory and endocytic pathways in eukaryotic cells. This Compartments are said to be topologically equivalent if as they can communicate with one another in the sense that molecules can get from one to other without having to cross a membrane. Topologically equivalent spaces are shown in red. So these uh, are topologically equivalent um, spaces. So in the figure A, you can see molecules can be carried from one compartment to another topologically equivalent compartment by vesicles. So this is a vesicle. This is also topologically uh, equivalent compartment. So a vesicle gets barred out from this compartment and then gets barred in into the another compartment. So that barred from one and fused with the uh, other. In the case of B, we can see that cycles of membrane, budding and fusion permit the domain of any of the organelles shown to communicate with any other and with the cell exterior by means of transport vesicles. So in the case, in this case, blue arrows indicate that extensive outbound and inbound vesicular traffic, some organelles, most notably mitochondria and uh, plastids do not take part in this communication and are isolated from a vesicular traffic between organelles shown here. So this is a plasma membrane, this is nucleus, this is the inner nuclear membrane, outer nuclear membrane and uh, this is rough ear associated with the, like it is attached with the nuclear membrane and this is Golgi apparatus and some uh, secretory vesicles and endosomes and lysosomes, basically this is a vesicular pathway uh, inside the cell. So what happens? Uh, vesicle budding and fusion during vesicular transport so transport vesicles uh, bud from one component that is donor 
and fuse with another component so it burns out and fuse with another component so this is this is uh, the target component uh, in the process soluble components which are red dot okay so red dots are getting passed so are transferred from lumen to lumen so here you have to know that membrane is also transferred and that the original orientation of both uh, proteins and lipids in the donor component and membrane is preserved in the target compartment thus a membrane protein retain their asymmetric orientation with the same domain always facing the cytoplasm so this is how the endocytic pathway uh, or the vesicular traffic trafficking happens inside cell now uh, we also have to um, note down a thing is that during this trafficking some signal sequence and sorting receptors direct proteins to the correct cell address so most protein sorting signals involved in the transmembrane transport so uh, if a protein needs to be delivered in some organ so there should be some sorting signals uh, so it 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 is a stretch of amino acid sequence okay 15 to 60 residue long such signals are often found at the end terminus of polypeptide chain so if it's a polypeptide chain it's the end terminal so some signals are there and in many cases specialized signal peptides remove the signal sequence from the finished protein once the sorting process is complete so once the protein is at its destined place some proteases can chop off the signal sequence so signal sequence can also be internal stretches of amino acids so not only the interminal part but also some internal stretches uh, stretches of amino acids can also be a signal sequence which remain part of the protein such signals are used in gated tra gated transport into the nucleus so the sorting signals can also be composed of multiple internal amino acid sequences that form a specific three dimensional arrangement of atoms on the protein surface such signal patches are sometimes used for nuclear import or in vesicular transports so each signal sequence specifies a particular destination in the cell proteins destined for initial transfer to the endoplasmic reticulum usually have a signal sequence at their end terminus that characteristically includes a sequence composed of about 5 to 10 hydrophobic amino acids many of these proteins will in turn pass from the ear to the golgi apparatus but those with a specific signal sequence of four amino acids at the c terminus are recognized as ear resident and are written to ear so specific four amino acid is that k d e l this specific four amino acid uh, sequence depicts that the pro the protein should be uh, there in ear proteins destined for mitochondria have signal sequence of yet another type and in which positively charged amino acids alternate with hydrophobic ones and finally many proteins destined for peroxisomes peroxisomes have a signal sequence of three characteristic amino acids at their c terminus we'll uh, discuss this more uh, detail uh, so if some protein uh, which gets translated uh, in the uh, cytoplasm if it wants to go to nucleus so this sequ this uh, signal sequence will help uh, the protein to go to nucleus okay lysine 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 arginine lysine then if it uh, want to export from nucleus again methionine this leucine and this leucine so methionine glutamine glutamine leucine serine uh, yeah, and then again leucine uh, like that then if we uh, want to uh, uh, import the protein in mitochondria so this is the amino acid stretch you need to uh, you need to understand and this is for this is for the plastid for peroxisome and for um, er so and if import into er and if it again uh, return to uh, return to er then the as i told kdel is the um, uh, sorting sequence or the signal sequence uh, present in a uh, protein so this is some uh, vesicular trafficking pathways that it can from cytosol it can go to any organelles in between uh, organelles there is also uh, like to and fro movement of uh, substances so now coming to some uh, discussion about nuclear envelope 
So nuclear envelope is a double membrane envelope and is penetrated by pores in which nuclear pore complexes are positioned. So nuclear envelope has some nuclear pore complexes through which uh, materials goes in and goes out. The outer nuclear membrane is continuous with endoplasmic reticulum and the ribosomes that are normally bound to cytosolic surface of the ER membrane and outer nuclear surface uh, here ribosomes reside. Okay. And also there is a nuclear lamina. So nuclear lamina is a fibrous protein net mesh work underlying the inner membrane of nucleus. So this is a nuclear pore complex. So this is a nuclear envelope, outer membrane and inner membrane. So this is a nuclear pore complex which is a protein which forms a pore and uh, it is or it is a multi uh, multimer or multi uh, multiple ma multimeric multimeric complex proteins where uh, you can see that uh, there are some membrane ring proteins some 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 proteins are forming nuclear baskets uh, channel nucleoporins scaffold nucleoporins like that and uh, there is also some disordered region of channel nucleoporins so mm, uh, this is some em uh, images of uh, nucleoporins or uh, npcs nucleopore complexes now coming to some uh, basic uh, uh, discussion on cell division so you can see some chromosomes in cell uh, some diagrammatic images so where you can see two adjacent plant cells photographed through a light microscope the dna has been stained with a fluorescent dye dapi that binds to it the dna is present in chromosome so but a dapi we can uh, we can uh, image any dna by using fluorescent dye dapi it will bind to dna uh, and it will uh, we can um, we can get to see by microscope which become visible as distinct structure in light microscope okay so we can see how the division happens the chromosome gets segregated into two uh, different poles of a cell and then uh, cytokinesis happens uh, so and this is the experiment ex uh, one experiment uh, which depicts depicts that which is the genetic material so in the class uh, uh, course instructor has already covered that so here what happens that the uh, scientist wanted to know that which is the gen genetic material okay which is a which is the which is the thing dna rna or protein is a uh, heritable information so they started with a strain or smooth pathogenic bacterium which causes pneumonia and uh, they did random mutation and then a strain uh, pneumonic uh, bacteria became uh, R strain or rough non pathogenic uh, mutant bacterium. Then live R strain, uh, strain cells uh, grown in presence of either heat killed A strain cells or cell free extract of A strain. So then uh, these R R strain th those are non-pathogenic so when this live uh, R strain cells were grown in the presence of heat killed S strain uh, S strain cells or cell free ex extract of S strains what happens Th there is a transformation of R strain to S strain so some R strain cells are transformed to S strain cells whose daughters are pathogenic and cause pneumonia so the conclusion is that some molecules is there that carry heritable information can present in S strain so but now question the question is that what is the heritable mo uh, molecule is it RNA is it protein is it DNA is it lipid or carbohydrate so then what they did they did fractionation of cell free extract into classes of purified molecules they purified RNA protein DNA lipid and carbohydrates from the cell fractionation and then they tested molecule for transformation they only in the presence of RNA they did the same experiment only presence of protein and DNA and so on so then when they uh, did the experiment in the presence of DNA the molecule that carries the heritable information is DNA they concluded because that time only the R strain got uh, converted into a strain now some uh, review of uh, what is building blocks of dna we know that uh, sugar um, and uh, base it forms nucleotide and then this is a double stranded dna where 5 prime to 3 prime and 5, 3 prime to 5 prime orientation is there um, so dna forms a double helix 
so we know that complementary best pairs in the dna double helix, double helix we can see uh, so adenine uh, makes bond with thymine uh, guanine makes bond with cytosine and uh, they add in to thymine there is a two in double di in, uh, hydrogen bond and go on into cy cytosine there is a triple hydrogen bond so this is the dna double helix uh, we have already covered and discussed so now again the, the this is a cross section view of the typical cell nu nucleus where we can see that uh, there is some uh, so th in the sex, uh, nucleus there is genome or dna is present so uh, and uh, in inside nucleus nuclear nucleolus is also present so the darkly stained area is heterochromatin uh, where chromosomes are packed uh, uh, more compactly and lightly stains are uh, euchromatin so uh, dna and associated proteins uh, plus many rna and um, protein molecules this dot 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 uh, diagrams are so we have discussed about the nuclear envelope this is nuclear lambda then the, the central the centrosome is also present which um, gives rises to microtubules now uh, we know that human chromosome is a uh, like you can see this is, a, this is a chromosome human chromosome 22 in this mitotic conformation composed of two double stranded we know that it composed of two double stranded dna molecules each of 48 into 10 to the 6 nucleotide pair long so we need to understand that uh, uh, if we consider 10 percent of the chromosome so this uh, this consists of 40 genes and again if we consider only one percent of the chromosome contains four genes and one gene con contains some uh, nucleotide pairs okay and then uh, that from that gene uh, that gets uh, expressed and R it, it uh, transcribes into rna and then from rna it gets translated into protein and the protein become becomes properly folded so this is the cell cycle where it consists of interface m phase and again interface uh, so uh, so in, in, in the case of interface when gene expression and chromosome duplication uh, happens in the case of S phase and then mitosis uh, the cell divides the three DNA sequence required to produce a eukaryotic chromosomes that can be replicated and then segregated accurately at mitosis so this is telomere this is replication origin and centromere okay so what happens now replication origin where the dna replication uh, starts so each chromosome has multiple origins of replication one centromere and two uh, multiple origin of replication there is uh, another centromere and another tel telomere so the dna replicates uh, in the phase of interface beginning at the origin of replication and proceeding bidirectionally from the origin across the chromosome is there any question okay so in m phase the centromere attaches with the attach, attaches the duplicated chromosome to the mitotic spindle so that a copy of the entire genome is distributed to each daughter cell during mitosis the spatial structure that attaches the centromere to the spindle is a protein complex called kinetogor so we have multiple times discussed the cell cycle process so in cell cycle if we quantitatively uh, see the amount of dna we can see uh, and the number of cells so so here you can see the number uh, relative amount of dna per cells uh, it depicted as one and two and this is some intermediate state so uh, so this the amount of cells in g1 phase is high higher and the amount of dna is uh, half that is one here half of two and when cells are in s phase so there the amount of uh, dna is intermediate where uh, dna is getting replicated and uh, in the case of uh, g2 or m phase when dna ha has been um, uh, replic has replicated uh, has been replicated uh, properly and uh, so the amount of dna will be 
doubled now uh, uh, now coming to the cell cycle when the cell cycle is happening we need to regulate the cell cycle so there are some checkpoints and there are some uh, controllers uh, which are cyclin cdk complexes uh, which uh, i was discussing during uh, discussing the questions uh, uh, and answers so there are few stages in the cell cycle g1 s g2 m and again g1 so some cyclin cdk complexes like g1 s cdk uh, will act in the case of g1 where g1 s cyclin will be higher and then, then again the g1 uh, s cyclin level will be decreased uh, and in the case of s phase s cdk and cyclin will be higher so s cyclin will be high uh, during s phase likewise different cyclins and cdk gets activated and then gets inactivated to regulate the cell cycle so there are some major cyclins and cdk's of uh, yeah, some organism vertebrates and budding yeast so so you have to uh, you have to uh, know that some the, actually the function is same but it's named differently in different organisms like that like the cdk1 is named as uh, in budding is cdk1 only but uh, the original name of cdk1 was cdc2 in both vertebrates um, and fusionist so we had uh, covered the thing that cdk will get bound with cyclin and uh, will become active and then it will become um, if it phosphorylated by v1 it will become inactivated and if it again uh, dephosphorylated by cdk activating uh, uh, dephosphorylated by cdc25 it will become uh, active so cdk activity can be suppressed by inhibitory phosphorylation and cdk inhibitory proteins so so where we can see cyclin and cdk uh, is uh, is making a complex and this is activating phospho pho phosphates which uh, by cdk activating kinase so v1 will phosphorylate that site and become it, it, it the complex has become inactive and when cdc25 will remove this phosphate the complex will become active again and uh, it also depends on inhibitory phosphorylation and cdk inhibitory proteins so where we can see the inhibition of a cyclin cdk complex by a uh, cdk inhibitor protein that is p27 so it will bind with the cyclin cdk complex and then um, uh, the if uh, p27 is, is bound to it distorting the active site of the cdk and it also inserts the atp binding sites inserts into the atp binding site then further inhibiting the enzyme complex now some control of proteolysis by anaphylge promoting complex so the control of proteolysis by apcc and scc scf during cell cycle so apcc is activated is activated in mitosis by association with cdc20 which recognizes specific amino acid sequence on m cyclin and other target proteins with the help of two additional proteins e1 and e2 apcc assembles polyubiquinylated chains on the target protein the poly ub q nihilated uh, target will then recognize and degraded at proteasome so this is the activating subunit cdc20 and this is inactive apc so when they, the um, activating subunit will bind to inactive apc the complex will become active and then um, what do, uh, what it will do this uh, it will yeah, it is anaphage promoting complex okay so it will end end up the mitotic phase so it will bind to m cyclin and cdk and then gets degraded to m cyclin so anaphage will be promoted likewise uh, control of proteolysis by scf so the activity of ubiquitin ligase scf depends on so uh, the so scf is a ubiquitin ligase so it depends on substrate binding substrate subunits called a box protein of which there are many different types the phosphorylation of a target protein such as the here yeah, there's example of cdk inhibitor protein so phosphorylation depends on kinase okay when the scf comes uh, it can uh, ub it can ubiquinal it helps in ubiquinal annihilation of cdk inhibitor proteins so um, allows the target to recognize by a specific specific a box subunit 
so this is the summary uh, of uh, today's discussion of some major cell cycle regulatory proteins cdk activating kinase uh, v1 cdc25 and some cdk inhibitory proteins uh, along with p27 p21 p26 so these are cdk inhibitory proteins this these all of this will inhibit cdks okay and some there are some examples of ubiquitin ligase the SCF we discussed and their activators. Now we'll briefly discuss about cell cycle. So in prophos we know that uh, what happens. So in the cell you can see this is a centrosome, okay, and it forms the mitotic bundles. So in prophos what happens? Now replicated or uh, already chromochromatic is replicated. So replicated chromosomes uh, each consist of two closely associated sister chromatids, condens. Then outside the nucleus, the mitotic spindle assembles between the two centrosomes which have replicated and moved apart. Then in prometaphase, what happens? Now, prometaphase starts abruptly with the breakdown of nuclear en envelope. So in the case of prophase, the nuclear membrane also start breaking down. So then uh, chromosomes can now attach to spindle. Then the chromosomes start attaching with spindle fibers via their kinetophores and uh, uh, ultimately undergo active movement then in the phase of metaphase the chromosomes are aligned at the equator uh, so the equator is midway of the spindle poles so the two, the middle distance between the two spindle pole, poles from centrosomes the, then in the anaphase the sister chromatids synchronously separate to form two daughter chromosomes and each is pulled slowly toward the spindle pole um, then the kinetochore microtubule gets shorter and the spindle poles also move apart so those uh, daughter chromosomes will move apart to two different poles and in telophase what happens now the two sets of daughter chromosomes arrive at the poles of the spindle and then they again decondense a new nuclear envelope um, reassembles around its state completing the formation of two nuclei and uh, marking the end of mitosis and after telomeres is followed by cytokinesis where proper cell the cell will be uh, like for, for the plant cell the cell wall will form and for animal cells cell membrane will form and then the two different cells uh, it will form uh, from one cell it will form two different cells now We will discuss how DNA damage uh, arrays to the cell cycle in G1. So during DNA replication, if DNA damage happens, uh, so we uh, the cell cycle should not should not proceed. Okay, so we have to first uh, repair the DNA damage. Then only we should uh, the cell should proceed to the further step. So when DNA is damaged, various uh, protein kinases are required uh, to the site of damage and initiate signaling pathway that causes cell cycle arrest. So the first kinase at the damage site is either ATM or ATR kinase. Then it gets activated. Then it activates CHK1 and CHK2 kinase activation. Additional uh, protein kinase called CHK1 and CHK2 comes into the play. Then uh, what happens? MDM2 normally binds to P53 and promotes its UV cutanation and destruction in proteosome. But when this kinase gets active, it phosphorylates P53 and P53 becomes stable and active. Then P53 binds to the regulatory region of P21 gene. P21 will be transcribed and translated. Then what ha what what it do? It does uh, bind with active uh, G1 SCDK and SCDK, and then the G1 SCDK and SCDK will be complex with P21, and it will inact it will in become inactive, and the cell cycle will be. Uh, disrupted so uh, this is all for today's interaction classes uh, next week we will discuss some uh, points of week 3 and week 4 
and also uh, week three and uh, some assignments from week three um, and uh, the previous year's week three um, assignments so if you have any doubt regarding week three or if you want me to discuss you can let me know if you have already gone through uh, week three and week four lectures so else i will stop uh, today's class if you don't have any questions uh, or queries that we can discuss tomorrow Hmm. Yes. Think about uh, nitrogen as gas, ma'am. Yes. Yes. Tell me. Say about nitrogen as gas, ma'am. Oh, okay. So, so this is this is slide you can see. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So uh, there are two kind of, kinds of bases, nitrogenous bases present in DNA, okay, purine and pyrimidine. So uh, purine is one cyclic uh, ring and purine consists of two cyclic rings. So those are basically uh, nitrogenous bases. So we know that uh, deoxyribonucleic acid and ribonucleic acid, right? So in that cases, we know that two uh, two kinds of bases are there purine and pyrimidine and that that gets that forms n glycosidic bond with the sugar with the sugar like uh, deoxyribose sugar or ribose sugar in the case of rna so here it consists nitrogenous bases is consist of is a six membered uh, cyclic ring for pyrimidine and this is a two cyclic ring where which is a nine member ring okay so in the case of pyrimidine we can see if uh, we have to uh, see that one two three four five six okay these are all carbons there are two nitrogens so it can be of three types uracil cytosine and thymine based on other groups attached with other carbons so uh, for dna dna has thymine so in the thymine that one two so two two will be keto group c double one two and then three nh then four again keto group five will be methylated and six so this is thymine in the case of cytosine what is cytosine not two uh, keto four amino uh, pyrimidine okay this is cytosine and then another nitrogenous base is there which is uracil which the structure is same as thymine but it doesn't have any uh, five methyl group so uh, those are basically nitrogen containing ring compounds uh, which is present in dna uh, dna and rna both and purine these are two cyclic ring uh, is there one is uh, hexagonal and another is uh, you can see how many sides are there one two three four five five okay so here you can see also uh, a one cyclic uh, chain consists of two nitrogen and another cyclic uh, ring also consists of two nitrogen uh, here also the one two three four uh, positions gets uh, um, attached with different different uh, chemical groups like uh, here in the case of adenine the six uh, the, the, name, the chemical uh, name of adenine is six amino purine okay so and also in guanine we can see that uh, the six carbon is keto group and uh, two carbon is uh, attached with amino group so that is two amino uh, six keto guanine so that is all and this uh, purine and pyrimidine nitrogen bases can form a hydrogen bond between um, um, among each other adenine uh, forms hydrogen bond with thymine and uh, cytosine forms hydrogen bond with guanosine uh, like that thank you ma'am
ma'am yes on second ma'am yes tell me uh, new nucleotide nucleotide joining with phosphodiester bond ma'am nucleotide yeah 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. In DNA. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Ah, uh, purine, purine and the primidine ah uh, bond is the uh, hydrogen bond, ma'am. Yes, yes. One nucleotide to another nucleotide joined with the phosphodiester bond, ma'am. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Mm, okay, ma'am. Phosphodiester bond between five prime and three prime. Okay. so that's uh, let me go through the structure again if you have any doubt look so here different nucleotides are there okay so two nucleotides are forming bond between between so as a sugar phosphate backbone okay this is also called sugar phosphate backbone where 3 prime to 5 prime bond formation is there and uh, and some bases are thrown out of the backbone so these are the bases adenine guanine thymine cytosine so in between those bases hydrogen bond this red red bonds are hydrogen bonds but in the backbone there is phosphodiesteric bond okay ma'am thank you okay. thank you here also you can see these are phosphodiesteric bond in the sugar phosphate backbone if you don't have any question or anything to tell me to discuss in next class then i will stop today's class uh, and will again have class on uh, next tuesday will again have class on next tuesday uh, for covering week 3 contents if you have any specific doubt from today's class uh, if you can let me know i will go through again tomorrow and uh, also some assignments question i will discuss thank you so much guy thank you so much folks that's all for today's class thank you ma'am thank you thank you thank you, thank you.